All right. Well, today I want to talk about legacy, a lasting legacy. And I'll be in Psalm 127 after a bit, not starting there immediately. But uh, last week we talked about belonging. And today, legacy, this is a part of our mission statement that we have to believe big, belong strong, and build a legacy. And obviously, I'm not going in order. I started in the middle last week, and now I'm picking up on the end. And, and then uh, I don't know if I'll do, uh, I'll do the beginning part next week or not. I haven't really decided. I've got a few things on my heart to share. I may jump in and, and may not. Uh, we'll see. We've got Father's Day coming up next week and so forth. But I think it's really important to understand belonging and how we belong and, and, and where it is we fit in and, and know that we're at peace about that. That's really, really important. And, and if you missed that message, uh, I think it would be valuable to go back and review it so that you can understand the process that God leads us to or through as well. But today I want to talk about legacy. I remember us uh, building this, this mission statement and we were on an elders retreat and and uh, we, I, Lou and Tracy weren't apart then, and we was just, uh, I don't know, however, you know, the four couples, and we were really wrestling out this believe big, belong strong, and build a legacy. And I remembered that the first two kind of came quickly, and, and we were like, yeah, that's us. That's what we want to grow into. And, and the third line, we just kind of struggled. We knew what we wanted to say, but it wasn't coming. I think Pastor Billy was the one that just had the word of the Lord. He was like, build a legacy. And I remember the chorus of amens. It was just like, that's the Lord. It was just a, and when that came. And, and of course, we're understanding that in uh, multi-dimensions in our lives as well as the process that we believe the Lord is leading us from this place to another place we call building a legacy. And I want to give you an update on that this morning in the process of the message, kind of where we're at. Uh, some of you have been asking, and uh, we've been We've been, uh, we were, that was more prominent uh, back about a year ago and for several years than it is right now. So I'll tell you the reason why and, and what we're in. But I want to talk about just um, a legacy for ourselves individually and then as a church body and what that, what that actually means. So let's, uh, first of all, just kind of define legacy, what it is. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul describes Timothy's faith. And he says this, he says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, he's speaking to Timothy, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. So the Apostle Paul recognized that the faith that Timothy had was not just something that was started from zero. It was something that was lived out in his mother and also his grandmother and the Apostle Paul must have been around them and picked that up. And he said, Timothy, I'm convinced that the sincerity of their faith also lives in you. Now we understand that Timothy's faith wasn't received by genetics. It wasn't received because he had the same last name as his mother and grandmother. But it was the fact that that he had taken their faith and he had made it personal. In other words, it was his faith. And yet it was something that was passed down through his two generations for him to grapple with and receive. A couple of Sundays ago we had Youth Sunday and, and one of the youth shares, very powerful, Michael Carlson, he shared the fact that he'd grown up in a Christian home and that he just grew up under this understanding that he had his parents' faith. But then he went to a youth conference, and during that youth conference, God met him personally. And as a result of that encounter with God, he understood that now their faith was his faith. It was personal to him, and it was an incredible testimony that he shared of that transition. And if you've grown up at a Christian home, you would understand that transition. There's a time where we take the faith of our parents, and we, we grapple with what does it mean for it to be ours. Now, if you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you, you, you know, you're, you're around other people and you meet other Christians and you recognize that they have something that you don't and you grapple with how you make that your own. And sometimes that comes easier for others than it does for some. I've noticed that people that are first generation Christians oftentimes have a lot to battle out in their lives. It's because they don't really have this legacy inheritance from their parents or from their family of origin or maybe from their grandparents, but it's actually they're starting new. They're starting fresh. 
And sometimes that can be exciting, but other times there can be a lot of battles that have to ensue in order to really get in the flow. And if you come from a family where your parents are Christians or your grandparents were Christians, sometimes it's a lot easier for you to go through the battles because of the legacy that you've inherited of the faith that they've lived. Sometimes you don't have to battle the things that they battled because they did it for you. And they shed a, set up a protection and a shield for you around you that you have to, you have to battle other things, but you might not have to battle what they battled through. And yet there's something like we're further down the road when we have a legacy of faith versus starting from zero. I remember growing up in my home and on the, um, on the living room wall, there was a plaque of my grandfather. I didn't know him. He died several years before I was born. But right below his picture, there was a, um, a, a part of his will that was printed out, the, uh, the end of his will, and I just thought I would read it to you this morning of part of the legacy that he wanted to pass on to his heritage and his children. And so, again, I just have a picture of it there. I think my aunt put together. But I just thought I would read the, the desire on his heart to be able to pass on to the generations to come. He said, I bequeath to my beloved children and to their families that faith in the Holy Trinity that confidence in the full inspiration and integrity and authority of the Holy Scriptures, and that hope in the promise of the return of our Lord Jesus, uh, uh, Lord Savior Jesus Christ, and all of which has sustained me through a life as a child of God, as a father, and as a minister of the gospel, and as a bishop in the Mennonite church. May all of you live in harmony with the conservative evangelical faith of the Mennonite church and only follow me as I have followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now obviously we're not a part of the Mennonite church anymore and sometimes I wonder if grandfather would be in the way that that denomination has drifted in some ways. We are aware that a lot of denominations that were on point for a period of time when we grew up, suddenly begin to drift in a direction that is outside of the Holy Scriptures. And yet the reality of what he wrote about holding that the Word of God is the Word of God, the Trinity, the, the, the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit, I still endorse today. I adopt today. And he wrote that as an inheritance to those that would come, that we would follow in the same path of faith as he did, honoring the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. But again, as he wrote that, I had to decide for myself. I had to make it personal for me. as the same as my parents had to make it personal for them. And so that's how legacy works. It's lived out by somebody else, but then we ourselves have to decide that we want to come into it as well. So what is legacy? It's defined as something transferred by inheritance. Something transferred by inheritance. I want to give you just four scriptures that support that. First is in Psalm 78, 4. It says, We will not hide them from, we will not hide from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy worthy deeds of the Lord, his power and wonders he has done. Psalm 145.4 says, One generation commends your works to another, and they tell of your mighty acts. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And finally, Philippians 4.9 Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or even seen in me, Put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. All of these scriptures has to do with legacy. What I've learned, I'm passing along to you. Now you choose and walk in what the Lord is showing you. Number two, legacies grow from two structures. Legacies have structures. And the interesting part of looking at these structures is that sometimes they can creep into the church. Well, some should but not necessarily how they are passed on in the world. You have a monarchy structure 
where legacy is passed on. That's family-based with a governmental support. And then you can have an empire-based structure that is one person controls the masses. And again, both can pass along a legacy, but which one is stronger? The monarchy is stronger than the empire. As we think of an empire, I happen to think in modern day, I think of Hitler. He was a modern day empire. He built an empire quickly and people rallied around him. But when the empire folded, so did the government, so did the country, so did the masses. It folded, it was built over time fairly quickly, but then it folded quickly. Not that there's not philosophies today that still exist, but they don't have any influence in the same way that they did when Hitler was building the empire of the Nazi party. Now the other uh, structure that we have that we commonly think of a monarchy would be the British monarchy today. And, however, in, in my research I understood that there's no empires today that are, that are in play. I don't know if I fully understand that or maybe I would question that. But they said there's 44 monarchies that are in existence today still in practice. And some of them over decades, over centuries, they're still working, they're still operating, they're still ruling. Most monarchies are uh, fashioned in a way that there is a family system and then there's a government beside of that that works out the day-to-day -day of the family values that come down through the monarchy. So as we look at these two different systems, which one's stronger? Well, I mentioned it. The monarchy's stronger. It's a family system that basically brings the value of the family into the next generation. And as a result of that, then it remains strong. Now it can, again, go off, but it's much stronger than an empire. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these two can creep into the church. In fact, one should. We should be a family model based on the family of heaven. God is our Father. Jesus is our brother. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live this life. And we see that, that God's structure of legacy is actually a family-structured legacy. It's not empire-building. But empire building can creep into the church. One person making decisions for all the masses. I remember some years ago there was a pastor that moved into the area and started a church. And, and uh, the, the word was out that if you're an independent church, he's going to come visit you because he wants you to then join him and kind of build this network of churches suddenly that's going to, again, take over the community. Well, I did get a visit from him, but I didn't take I recognized what was going on, and yeah, that person came into town, and, and after a few years, they left as quickly as they came, because he was trying to build an empire off of himself, and not on the kingdom, which is family. Now, a couple of traits that happen is that um, the monarchy, or a family building, happens through influence. Even monarchies today, that's how they, they would expand, was through influence. They would take somebody that is in home base and they would send them out to, send, to, to build a colony just like the one that they came from. And so they would actually build through influence, same way we would in the kingdom of God. Empires build through conquest. They would go out and they would fight and they would battle and they would demand these people take on their values. And so it wasn't in the heart of the people that they were conquering. That's how empires conquer and that's why they fold so quickly because it's not in the heart of the people. They also have values that are, that are passed on. So family structures oftentimes build slow and then all of a sudden they get big suddenly where empires, they build fast and then they fall fast. And again, we can look around the church and see sometimes that these are used and yet um, the, the one that is really, I understand, from heaven would be the monarch or the family. Now, we at Crossroads, we want to build with a family model. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody has our last name. That's not the point. The point is, again, what we demonstrated this morning in being covenant members, that we say, hey, regardless of my last name, I, Jesus is Lord, and I want to be a part of the Crossroads family. We're a part of a larger family called Dove International. And so we're a family within a family, and that's the way God intended, so that we would grow and live out kingdom values within a family structure 
And that's how we are, again, operate. It's uh, not about one person. It's about the family together with leadership and that governmental structure that God gives us that we work out things and move forward in what he has in mind. Number three, what are the components of a strong, godly legacy? Now I finally made it to, to um, Psalms 127. You can join there with me or, or watch behind me. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are, in heritage, are, are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in the court. We see elements of a strong godly legacy in this psalm. The first is found in verse 1. When we're building a strong legacy, it requires workers. He starts out and said in, Psalm, in, uh, in uh, 127, 1, the first part, he says, when you, uh, it, it, when you, unless the Lord builds a house, the workers labor in vain. Now, when the Lord begins to build something, it doesn't mean he sends a construction crew down from heaven and we just sit and watch. It means that we are the workers. We are the ones that receive the vision from him, and we collectively agree that we've heard a vision from him, and we're all together say, what's my part in doing that? And we have different gifts and different abilities in order to carry out the vision that God have us, has us in the legacy that he wants to live or leave through us. And so it requires that we have workers together in this vision. And that, that uh, um, means a, a strong vision that we have. The second, it picks up at the, in the middle of verse 1. It says, unless the Lord watches over the city... The guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food and eat, for he grants sleep to those that he loves. And those parents that have young children say, I don't think that's true. <laughs> yes, it will come after six months. He will grant sleep back to those he loves. But not for six months. <laughs> but uh, the Lord... Watchers, I would consider the values. In other words, he changes from a building to a city. He said the Lord watches over the building process, but then he says the Lord watches over a city. So when the Lord is watching over a city, what does that mean? That he's watching over people. That's what it means. That he's just concerned with whatever you're building tangibly as he is the people that you have with you or the people that you're going to reach. And so it's important for us to understand that in the legacy God wants to bring through us in the future, that it includes not just a place that we gather, but it's also the people that are gathering and the people that will come and benefit from the legacy that he wants to bring through us. And it's important for us to understand that God is concerned on both. And so the watchers are those that are making sure that we are upholding the values that God has given us, not, again, just a focus upon a building that he would have us build. What's the word vain mean? The word vain means obsolete or worthless or even evil. He said it's vain. The third component of a strong legacy is to have warriors. Not just workers, not just watchers, but warriors. And he gives the word picture here that the children or the next generation are your warriors. They are the ones that are going to contend on the front lines with the next thing that God is doing in the earth today. And we have to understand that we, there's times that we have to war in the generation that we are in with the generations together about what God wants to do with us all. 
God loves every generation. He loves grandparents. He loves parents. He loves children. He loves grandchildren. He loves great-grandchildren and beyond. He's a, he just loves people, and he loves the generations. And so he likens the fact that when you have a strong legacy, there will be times that we war to, uh, to involve the next generation. Maybe it's, maybe it's over a value, or maybe it's over, again, a decision we can't uh, decide on, that we have to really seek God together until we figure it out and find it out and hear from him together. It took Solomon seven years to build the temple. He spent 13 years on his own house. I don't know what that says about him. But it took seven years to build the temple. Maybe because that David provided all the material for him to start building. Maybe building his own house, he had to go down and cut the trees and, and, and you know, let the lumber uh, dry out and stones. But David provided all the material his father did. That was the legacy that his father gave to him as his son Solomon. And then he went to work and he built the temple, the first temple of Solomon, magnificent in seven years. And so it took time to, again, bring the legacy into fruition as they did in the Old, uh, Old Testament times, and we understand that as well. I, I'm just taking for granted that not everybody read the newsletter this week, but there's a great illustration that I wrote, and I want to uh, kind of bring it for you here this morning, that describes how God's legacy is brought forth in the world today. It was uh, a, uh, a blog that I found that was written by Susan Bosak. And she talks about legacy. She explains, where do you think it's best to plant a young tree? A clearing in an old growth forest or an open field? Ecologists tell us that a young tree grows better when it's planted in an area with older trees. The reason, it seems, is the roots of the young tree are able to follow the pathways created by the former trees, and implant themselves more deeply. Over time, the roots of many trees may actually graft themselves to one another, creating an intricate, interdependent foundation hidden underground. In this way, stronger trees share resources with weaker ones so that the whole forest becomes healthier. That's legacy. An interconnection across time with a need for those who have come before us and a responsibility for those who come after us. Legacy is about life and living. It's about learning from the past, living in the present, and building for the future. Wow. And so all the generations that are living at this time, right now, are involved in legacy. All just like the trees in a forest. Legacy requires workers that see the vision. Legacy requires watchers over the values to make sure the people are being cared for. And legacy requires warring at times because the enemy wants to stop God's plan. In 1986, before I entered ministry... I went to a church conference and a pastor spoke there for five minutes and he sat down. This is what essentially he said. He said that I told my church last Sunday I was resigning from being their pastor. They knew something was up but they didn't know what. And then he finished his sentence and said next Sunday I plan to become the pastor of this community. Amen. Something happened to me at that moment. I've never heard anybody share that. But something settled into my heart to say that's the direction God's taking the church. He wants to pastor a community, not just have a great church. And that was really resident in my heart through the 80s and into the 90s. And I wasn't in a setting where that began to bear fruit until Wanda and I, through the call of God, moved to Winchester. And after I moved, I began to talk to other pastors about just going away and praying together. And many uh, that I talked to said, yes, I'd love to do that. Others didn't go with us. And so for about four or five years, we would go with just a pocket of pastors and go for three or four days, no agenda except to pray together. And I built tremendous relationships and trust during those times of three days. In fact, some of my closest friends in the area are pastors that we spent time praying together during that season. 
And then in year uh, around uh, 2021, 20, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2010, 2011, one and I got acquainted with a movement called Presence Centered Community Transformation. We had heard about it, but I had no grid to fit it in. And suddenly it began to understand how God was changing all communities through his presence coming and visiting those communities. And we began to understand the principles behind it and hear the stories behind it and even visited a community in Kentucky where that had indeed take, taken place. And so we invited someone to say, we want God's presence here in our community. And we did a 21-day joining together with five other churches, well, five churches total, we had 375 people crammed in this space where you're sitting this morning. There was people in the foyer. There was people in the kitchen. There was people in the prayer room. We had people sitting on the floor. We had the stage crammed full of people, including the workers, it was, and including the worship team. It was amazing. And as we walked through that the first week, God showed us a manifestation of what would happen if he would fully come. And that is the police scanner in town <clears throat> didn't register problems coming in for four days. We were told that. God says, see, this is what happens when I come to town. <laughs> and we don't know the fullness of what God did in, during that time. We believe that he wants to do more in this town. Not just through Crossroads, but all the churches. All the churches that name the name of Jesus. That he wants to do more, working together in our town. He wants to exhibit more of his presence. And that seed that was in my heart that got planted in 1986 began to take fruit again over a period of time, walking into the 2000s. And now we come to today in 2020. I got ahead of myself earlier. Someone in the church found a piece of land that they said, maybe this is for us. And so we pursued that. We didn't have any money for a down payment. We pursued that. That parcel didn't work out for whatever reason. And yet we said, Lord, you know, we believe that you prompted us to prepare. Chris talked about preparing, inviting God in. He said, well, you want us to prepare. And so, again, during the, the pandemic, I call it a pandemic, but that's my own personal belief. During the pandemic, uh, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, we were able to raise over $500,000. Amazing. Yeah. God's amazing. <clears throat> and so again, it was just because you heard God and gave generously. And so that money sitting there, it's in several CDs that we're preserving it for the time that the Lord would say, here, now's the time and here's the place. We have uh, several parcels in mind, some buildings, but honestly yet, we have yet to have the amen from the Lord, this is it. Now's the time. And so that's where we're at. We're waiting on the Lord. It's been a year. Sometimes I get, Lord, when is the time? Where's the place? And, and not that there's not possibilities, and not that one of those possibilities isn't the one. It's just that God hasn't called us to, to step forward in that way and say, let's set our sights to this one. And go for it. And yet I do believe that there will be a time when we will find that place. And the Lord will say yes. And the finances will come in. And it's going to be a process. It was a process to, to get into this place. When I discovered this is where I wanted to be. We were meeting across the plaza at the um, Food Max International Food Store. It used to be an old children's gym. Boy, it was a, wow. We made it through. Well, I said, I wanted this space. And I thought we'd be in it in three months. Two years later, we came in. <laughs> but it was a process. I got a little, sh little short video clip of what we started with and where we ended up with just to encourage you. Let's take a look. 2005, where uh, construction was booming, it took us three months just to get our door in that you walk in today. Just couldn't get anybody to come and do it. Yep. It was really a mess. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, uh, we had contractors and, and cleaned it up. Obviously, we put walls in and, uh, and we started uh, to uh, build this place out. And after that, it was really, you know, the, the subs that we hired, they just did basic paint. And then we had everybody that was uh, over a particular area go and really fine-tune their area like the nursery people mm -hmm. painted the nursery the 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 youth did the youth the pulse did the youth 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kids church. It, it was mm -hmm. just the prayer people. Yeah, it was just yeah. really great to see the... Um, Everyone took ownership of their space and yeah. they wanted to give it personality because we had not been able to do that anywhere else that we were at. Exactly. The first time that we could really take uh, mm -hmm. take ownership in what we're doing and, and mm -hmm. everybody was great. It was amazing. Yeah. Obviously, it looks a little bit different today. But just to bring everybody together, that what you see today didn't start out that way. You know, it's kind of like our lives sometimes. What you see today didn't start out that way. And I was reflecting in, in the, uh, the message of, of where I want to end up today. And, and really, um, number four, can I build again when my legacy got busted? Have you ever had your legacy busted? Yeah. You know, it can happen in different ways. Sometimes a premature death. Sometimes bankrupt bankruptcy. Sometimes a divorce. Sometimes just slipping into a disillusionment can bust our legacy. And I happen to think about Ruth, the book of Ruth, but actually more Naomi than Ruth. And Naomi was a uh, she, she was, she, you know, she um, married and had two, two children. And there was a famine in the land of Judah, and so they moved into a neighboring country. Uh, and as a result of that, her husband died. And then her two sons that had gotten married, they died. And she thought, my legacy's done. It's busted. She even would have changed her name to Myra, which means bitter. She thought she was finished. Finished? Serving God, finished the legacy that she had. She thought she was done. And she had these, these two daughter-in-laws, and she didn't know what to do. She didn't have a job. She didn't have income. She's living in a foreign land among foreigners. So she said, I guess I'll move back home. And that's what she did. She decided to move back home. And as she got back home, then things began to change. Her daughter-in-law, one went with her, and one stayed back with, with her family in the foreign land. And Ruth was her name, and... So she just needed to survive. She went out and she, she began to glean after the harvesters and she began to pick up what was left over so they could just live. And over the course of time, Naomi began to recognize what was going on here. And she recognized that the place that Ruth happened to go was a single man, a rich man at that. If you're going to be single, you know, as a, as a woman, you want to marry a rich man, right? <laughs> and, uh, better make sure he loves Jesus first. Better make sure he loved Jesus first. But Boaz did. And she began to recognize what was going on there. And so then she took action. She began to, to train her daughter-in-law, Ruth, how to understand the, the culture and how people got engaged and what would need to happen in order for her, a non-Jew, to marry a Jew. And part of that was the inheritance or the legacy that would be handed down. And they went through this involved process of, of where the land that, that stood in the way of, of, of the marriage needed to be transferred. And it was kind of a complicated thing, but they went through this process. And, and, and so, long story short, the guy that was to inherit the land, he said, I want the land. And then Boaz says, well, if you take the land, you've got to have Ruth. Oh, I don't need another woman. He said, I, I guess he was satisfied. And so he said, you, you can have the land and you can have Ruth. And they got married. And then they had a son. And the scripture says that Naomi claimed Ruth's, Ruth's son as her own. She said, now my legacy is restored. Now my inheritance is back. What would the, would the enemy destroyed through death? Being in a foreign land, I'm back. And now my legacy is being restored again. Three things that are really important that are illustrated in the story in order to return your legacy back to you. The first one was time. If you, wanna, if you feel like your legacy is busted through 
life experiences or relationships or whatever, just what God had going, the enemy came in and just busted it wide open, and now you feel like you're done. God says, no, you're not. But it's going to take time, and you're going to have to be patient. Naomi had to be patient. But then when she saw what God was starting to do with her daughter-in-law, suddenly she became intentional. And so it only not just takes time, there's also intention behind it. And she began to recognize that God was at work here, way beyond her understanding, and she began to cooperate with what God was doing to restore the legacy that she had lost. And so there was intention behind it. Not intentions, but intention. There's a difference. A lot of us have good intentions, right? But she was intentional. She took action with that. And then finally, there was inspiration. There was inspiration behind what she was doing. She actually got inspired. She recognized, wow, God is is giving my daughter-in-law that needs provision a husband and then a son. And as you read down through, you begin to understand that this son was uh, the father of Jesse and Jesse was the father of King David. That God grafted Ruth in And this son that was born, the legacy was restored. And God says, now I'm going to make him famous. He's going to be the great-grandson of, did I get that right? Of King David. And so what an incredible experience that sometimes our legacy gets busted through the plans of the enemy and sometimes our own ignorance or sometimes our own will for action. But don't give up. Don't give up. God wants to restore your legacy in Him. It takes time, it takes intention, and it takes inspiration. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to just reflect on legacy and the power of that and generational legacy inheritance that comes down through those that have gone before us and those that are living now. And I pray, Lord, that as we sit here today and we realize that you have given us an inheritance through Jesus Christ and you've given us the opportunity to pass it down to the next generation whether it be our own children or whether it be spiritual children that you would bring us just like you brought spiritual sons to Paul you brought him Timothy you brought him John Mark you brought him Titus and I'm sure there were many others that you brought to Paul and he imparted to them just like his own son. And so, Father, as a church today, we thank you for the legacy that you are bringing down through us, through the Crossroads family. And, Lord, we want to embrace that. And we want to, to become the workers that you need and the, 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 uh, the watchers that are important to guard the values and take care of the people in the process. And then the warriors at times will need to war against the enemy in order to see your kingdom come. And so, God, thank you today for reminding us of the legacy that you want to pass through us. And, Lord, I pray if there's those here this morning that are feeling like they were on a path and they got busted, their legacy got blown up, the enemy came in, not even with their own desires, just working through others, and totally bombed the legacy that you had in flow. Lord, remind them this morning that through time, through intention, and through inspiration, you want to restore the legacy you started through them. Father, thank you that we have the freedom to receive the legacy of living eternally with you through Jesus Christ. That's the starting place for all of us, Lord. We can't live off of somebody else's faith. There's time when you speak to us and we need to receive it as our own. We need to make Jesus Lord of our lives ourselves. 
not just that mom and dad have or some uncle or aunt or that we're sitting in a chair in a church we need to decide Jesus come be my Lord today from this day forth that's the first and most important inheritance that God wants to give us and maybe you're here this morning to say you know I haven't done that yet I've been thinking about it but I haven't done that yet I've been riding on the coattail of others but now it's time for me to decide for myself is that you this morning maybe listening online you recognize you've been putting it off you have good intentions but now you need to get intentional If that's you this morning in this house, obviously you can let us know online. Just slip your hand up to say, God's speaking to me about making Jesus Lord, about receiving inheritance from him this morning. Anybody here today? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you're working in our hearts, not only to receive, but to build the legacy that you want to give us not only individually or as a family but also as a church family and as a community God we believe that you want to leave a legacy through this community that would bless you and glorify your name we pray in Jesus name Amen